And welcome to the BSAVA Science webinar, taking a closer look at some of the papers published in the Journal of Small Animal Practice. I'm Louisa Dorma, Scientific Editor at the BSAVA, and today I'm joined by Nicola Di Garolamo and Silke Salavati to discuss the paper Retrospective Characterization and Outcome of Canine Idiopathic Mesenteric Purulent Lymphadenitis and Lymph Node Abscesses at a Teaching Hospital from 2005 to 2015. Nicola is an Associate Professor in the Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences at Oklahoma State University and is the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Small Animal Practice. Silke is a Senior Lecturer at the Hospital for Small Animals at the University of Edinburgh and a European Veterinary Specialist in Small Animal Internal Medicine. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. Hi, uh, thank you very much for having me. So Silka, I wondered whether I could just jump straight in with a question, if it's okay. Um, these diseases are quite rare in dogs, so I just wondered whether you could tell us a little bit more about the motivation for the research, please. Yes, I think the main motivation was that um, we saw two of those cases um, quite close to each other um, when I was still um, working in Germany and um, from, from where the papers also published. Um, and so that gave us the subjective impression that maybe this is a new disease that is becoming more, more frequent um, and we, we didn't quite know um, what we were dealing with. Um, because as I'm sure, um, you know, what we're going to discuss um, in, in a few moments is that um, it is quite a sort of vague and unspecific presentation and you have to do a lot of tests um, until you actually realize what is going on. Um, and so I guess what I'd like to always do is if I have a hypothesis um, in, in this case, or this is something that we haven't seen before and it might become more frequent, then I'd like to just test it rather than assume that that is what um, is going on. So I thought it would be a, a nice little project to go through our databases and see how many cases we have actually seen um, of these particular um, conditions um, and, and, you know, to see if that notion that it is something um, more common than I thought um, is, is true or not, um, which it turns out is still pretty rare. Um, so, but that, yeah, but that was the main, um, the, the main motivation because I think we all really like to make sure that we're dealing with some evidence-based, um, you know, research or that we base our, you know, clinical decision-making on, um, on something that is somewhat evidence-based. So I thought it would also be a good idea to, to figure out if somebody had already had more or less success with sort of different treatment options for, for this condition. Great, thank you. So building on that then, could you tell us a little bit more about what you did and what you found, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, um, so the, as you said, um, and I apologize for this very long title that you just had to um, read out there, um, but this is about um, a condition that I couldn't um, describe any better than giving it this sort of slightly awkward um, name. Um, and, 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 and as you said, in this case, the sort of abdominal or mesenteric um, lymph node abnormalities where you really um, can't find any other cause, but they are mostly sort of purulent, so neutrophilic inflammation or even sometimes um, abscesses forming. Um, and as I said, a lot of investigations potentially put into these cases um, to see if there is some cause uh, to this. Um, but in the end, uh, a lot of the times being pretty um, fruitless in finding what is going on. So um, this was a retrospective study, of course, um, as it is a rare um, disease. And I included these 10 years, so from uh, 2005 and 2015, because that was literally what the, the, the database um, was that I had at my, um, at my disposal um, at the time. Um, and then um, as it is with retrospective um, studies, there's the, the tedious part, which is the data mining, which basically sort of will, uh, will take up, up to like 75% of the work that goes into the study and then will actually be mentioned in three sentences in the, in the final paper, which means we, we looked for these, um, for these cases um, in, in three different databases of the hospital. So one was um, the surgery department, one was the medicine department, and one was our clinical pathology um, department um, to identify these cases. And then obviously a very big process of elimination um, of the cases that are either unclear or unsuitable um, or duplication um, starts. So you do a lot 
lot of um, data clearing. Um, and even though we had an enormous number of hits um, that uh, had these sort of keywords included either in the final diagnosis or in the sort of free text, um, thousands of cases, we ended up um, with maybe um, in initially a sort of 50 or so um, that we thought um, might fall into the category of these idiopathic lymphadenitis or abscesses um, and then we had to eliminate um, a lot of them even further um, because there was no um, tissue diagnosis available and so we ended up out of these thousands of cases um, as it always is um, with 14 that we could actually um, really analyze and then uh, because of that low case number what you often end up with is rather descriptive statistics and um, because there is not much um, in terms of you know looking at larger groups that you could compare um, to each other but I like the retrospective um, study still for for the fact that it is a good starting point and it gives you a good um, idea about where to go next and what pilot data um, might or might not sort of support your your hypothesis so in the end of those 14 dogs um, that we felt were reasonably um, justified to be called idiopathic um, with their abnormalities. Um, we wanted to look at what were their laboratory abnormalities, what were their clinical abnormalities, um, what were they treated with and what was the outcome and that's basically what the paper mostly um, describes. Um, so in, in detail really um, the majority of them seem to be relatively young um, dogs so I think the median age is about um, three three and a half years there was a slight skew towards the male um, population but I, I don't think I would over interpret that um, at this point too too much um, and in in terms of the presenting signs um, they were maybe a little bit as expected pretty vague so a lot of them just had pyrexia and um, lethargy in tense, maybe some abdominal pain and then there were some that had maybe signs that you would associate with the gastrointestinal tract like vomiting and, and diarrhea um, they had obviously, as it is with retrospective studies, a very variable degree of workup um, and some of them, you know, reading through the, between the lines, if you like, um, probably had a workup for, for what I would call pyrexia of unknown origin. So a lot of them had a lot of different tests done that weren't necessarily targeting the gastrointestinal tract or the lymph nodes initially. And then only when uh, these were found um, and sampled, and it was the only thing left, um, you know, in terms of explaining the signs, they were given this, um, this diagnosis of the idiopathic um, in inflammation there. Um, and that also means, of course, um, that we cannot 100% be sure that we haven't missed any other um, pathologies. Um, only a few of them, you know, for example, had pancreatic um, lipase testing. And I guess, you know, depending on where exactly these lymph nodes were, you might, you know, immediately think maybe there was some um, pancreatitis or something else that is otherwise maybe a little bit tricky to diagnose that um, that was missed. And in terms of treatment, um, the majority of them, 10 out of um, 14, um, had some sort of surgical um, intervention. And again, this is probably me reading between the lines of these files, but I think the tendency with the retrospective study is, or, or the tendency from clinical decision making is that if, if these abscesses look big, cavitated and really horrible, then you're probably more likely to go um, straight for surgery. Whereas there is a handful of mild to moderately enlarged lymph nodes and you sample them with FNA and they come back um, neutrophilic inflammation, you might not be so inclined to do, to do surgery. So certainly there was no um, um, sort of standardized approach to, to treatment um, and even the ones that weren't um, treated surgically even though you might now think they might have been milder in terms of how they were affected and um, they did actually pretty well. Um, out of this total of 14 dogs um, only three had a relapse between sort of I think one or three months after the initial um, diagnosis um, and um, obviously then we had different um, times of follow-up. Some of them you know we didn't have any follow-up after um, at all. Some of them we know, um, for example, that they were, you know, put to sleep or died of an unrelated cause, or they had maybe some follow-up diagnoses later on that, you know, are, are difficult to, to put into context with, um, with these diseases. Um, so I think overall, in terms of the the findings or the conclusions from this paper, I would say that it is still a rare disease, although, you know, maybe 
nowadays or in hindsight once you know it is there you might be looking out for it a little bit more and maybe it is um at least in its sort of milder forms a little bit um more common than than initially thought um but um that i guess a combination of surgical and and um you know conservative medical or antimicrobial treatment is probably justified and um, probably depending on the severity of the disease but i don't think this study was set out to um you know really make treatment recommendations so it was really more a descriptive study to say this exists and this is what we have done and now we have to decide how we would best you know uh, maybe deal with cases in the in the future Great, thank you. So you've touched on it already, really, but uh, one of the inherent problems with retrospective analysis is obviously that reliance on previously recorded data. And did you find that a lack of standardised diagnostic or therapeutic approach to cases had an impact on your kind of comparison or ability to compare cases? Yeah, I think the retrospective nature is always, um, in, in a way, as I said earlier, it is, it is an easy start because if you have a good database and you can um, search it for final diagnosis or, or you know, even sort of the freehand text um, and you know that on average you and your colleagues are pretty good in actually filling out this, um, this database and, and populating it with the right, um, you know, uh, uh, um, sort of buzzwords or, or diagnosis, then I still think it's a great it's a great tool but we have to be aware that it obviously you know all, every retrospective study has um you know the the sort of disadvantages that i just mentioned and um, we don't know the decision making um behind every sort of clinical case and we assume that um as i just said the maybe more severe looking cases were had a treatment bias and were treated differently um, from maybe more mildly affected cases. Um, and I guess, you know, also because this was done in a hospital in Germany where a lot of um, uh, owners have no pet insurance in comparison to, to the UK where I am now, you know, there's obviously also then the financial bias into this and there might have been um, some cases where surgery would have been recommended but wasn't done because the owners couldn't afford it um, or we don't know if potentially longer treatment would have prevented these relapse from happening or whether there was a financial, um, you know, component to not doing that because um, one or two of these antibiotics for a medium-sized dog for months on end that might be um, depending on what the drug is relatively expensive. So there's obviously lots of um, drawbacks um, due to the retrospective nature but I still think um, you know in a way that it is a very good starting point and it is particularly good if the disease is rare because if you wanted to do a prospective study about something like this you would have to do a multi-center study and um, because otherwise you would take forever to to collect those cases um, and equally even with the multi-center study um, and I'm sure everybody who has tried to do that um, knows very well that doesn't necessarily guarantee you that you get complete data um, from all of those cases um, either so I think particularly for rare conditions the retrospective study is actually quite quite okay yeah absolutely thank you yeah oh Nick I think you're muted still uh, you also mentioned that uh, the small master lander breed seem subjectively overrepresented in your sample population, uh, but the, the numbers were too small maybe to calculate, you know, odds ratio and uh, um, as compared to the to the uh, hospital population. So, um, do you have any, you know, hypotheses of why these could be? Yeah, I think this is a classical example of um, subjective assessment versus you know, when you really do the calculations um, and to a certain degree is also a decision that you probably have to make at the beginning of your data mining and not once you've already, you know, mined all those data and then go back because I think that might be really tricky. So I think, um, I mean, the even though the this breed, the small Münzerländer is a, is a German breed and it's not very rare, it still is rare enough that having three out of the 14 cases, um, you know, being that breed sort of makes you think um, that there might be some predisposing factor or overrepresentation. And in fact, um, the very first case um, that I saw with this um, was, uh, I think, you know, case number 14 on our list was what, and that was a small Münsterländer. Um, so maybe that is also then even 
further biasing you because you, you think, oh, that was the first one I've seen. So where are the other ones that are um, very similar? And I think what we probably would have to do um, is from the exact same time point from the 2005 to 2015, um, really look at how many um, of these dogs we would see in, in our hospital um, and then really calculate a, a, you know, a, a proper sort of risk or, or odds ratio, as you said. But at the time when you've already trialed through 4,000 or whatever cases, um, you know, I think you could have made the decision to go back and, and do that. But in this particular case, we decided not to. Yes, that, that, that makes sense. That makes definitely sense. Um, so in the discussion, you suggest that conservative management uh, of these disease can be an effective option when surgery is, isn't possible, um, especially if there isn't uh, septic peritonitis. Uh, um, given that these requires repeat treatment with uh, antimicrobials, could these have a, an impact on the development of resistances or um, something like that? Yeah, I think um, I think you're absolutely right. Um, th that is a really big question to, to ask. And I think it, it goes into the wider context of how and when we are using antimicrobials in small animals anyway. Um, and I guess one, one uh, sort of aspect of this is obviously um, regulations that might be very different from country to country and I am pretty sure for example that if that was be in a in a Scandinavian country we would not be able to do you know empirical antimicrobial treatment um, you know in these cases uh, for that duration of, of time um, in Germany the rules have have recently changed as well so there might be also an issue to do that um, and and the law actually at the moment says you can only treat with antibiotics if you have an anti a biogram that tells you that that is an appropriate thing so I guess you would at least have to have some sort of sample um, and and then the other aspect to to this is of course that any antimicrobial um, treatment will do things to the bacteria or the microbes in the gut of this in individual whether that's human or or, or dog or, or any other and I think because the microbiota and uh, is such a big topic in in recent years um, and we have actually quite a number of papers that in dogs and cats demonstrate what an incredible shift um, of the the distribution the function the composition of the microbiota you can um, you can create with a, a very sh relatively short course of antibiotics and um, we, we have to be mindful and we we have to be a little bit more critical um, with how how we're dealing with this. I guess in reality the problem is often that you know to the client or the dog owner the thousands potentially of pounds or, or, or dollars um, or euros for a surgical intervention versus a much smaller amount for let's say the first three weeks of treatment with antibiotics can be very attractive um, and I think you know that is something you probably have to weigh up on a, on a case to, to case basis but um, we, we don't have any guidelines that really tell us which antibiotic would be appropriate um, and I think it's also interesting to realize that we know that there are conditions in small animals where even though there are bacteria they are not the inciting cause and they are maybe just there secondarily so you know I, I have absolutely nothing to prove this um, and that is not what the what the point of this paper was but you could make a point to say why is that not some sort of immune mediated condition or something that has to do with permeability um, alterations of the gastrointestinal tract and only secondarily um, these bacteria that were also only found actually in a small number of cases in, in this retrospective study. Um, so only 50% of the dogs that were sampled actually had bacteria that could be cultured from those lymph nodes. So what if that is actually not the primary cause and we shouldn't maybe be treating with antibiotics or, you know, is there anything else that we should be doing before or after we treat with, um, with antibiotics? I think that's very, it's a very interesting question. And um, again, it wasn't the scope of this study to, to look into this, but I think that would be very interesting in the, in the future. Yeah, those are uh, actually excellent points, uh, something uh, we deal with 
uh, in everyday basically life uh, give, to give or not to give some antibiotics yeah. uh, in situation where it's difficult to obtain uh, an actual sample. Um, it, it is uh, definitely a complex uh, matter. Um, yes, yeah, sorry, I just realized, I don't think I've, I've answered um, d d whether, you know, what type of sample to, to, to use. Um, I think, you know, it has to be from the tissue of some description. So either you would have to take an, a fine needle aspirate and if that is enough sort of, you know, liquid or sample that you can get out, I would certainly send that for culture. And if you go in surgically, then I would do the same um, and also send a, a part of the biopsy um, or maybe a swab from the center of the abscessated um, lymph node for, um, for culture. And I think in a, in a way, the more samples, the better, you know, if you think that there are, um, you know, one that has more of a cavity and the other one is more solid, then I would probably, um, you know, send, send several um, just to increase your chances of finding something. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think it's going to be useful for um, everyone listening to what kind of samples can be obtained. Um, you mentioned uh, uh, the database search and how the database search was uh, kind of uh, uh, collapsed uh, in a few sentences in your paper. And uh, uh, I um, totally agree that uh, having, uh, um, like, we actually uh, selected your paper also because it was very well described, the database search, uh, but that is not often the case in uh, veterinary medicine. Sometimes uh, uh, we get, you know, maybe just one line that say, you know, these cases were found. Um, what do you think, how, how do you think uh, it was important in your case to do these, you know, three different searches, pulling them together? Do you think you obtain more data? Um, was this relevant? So for further researchers to, um, to maybe make the same choice. Yeah, I think transparency is important. And what I always say also, for example, if I write a paper with maybe one of the, you know, junior scientists or one of some of our residents is that if you have to write it so that the person reading it could be sitting at the computer or whatever tool you used and do the same thing by following your, your steps. If that is not possible in the way you've written it, then you haven't explained it well enough. And I think that is, you know, because I, I, I think we should be transparent and we shouldn't be hiding how we do things. And I, I realize, you know, it might not mean anything to a lot of people out there than to say, oh, I've used this software or this patient management system. But if you do come across it, then at least you know, um, you know that, that it has these particular tools or functions that, that were, were used. Um, and it, for the second half of your, of your question, how, how that really influences the, the, the database, I think, you know, a good retrospective study should start as wide as possible and then narrow down as sensibly as possible. And I think that will give you most the sort of the, the, the sort of the best output in terms of quantity, but then also in terms of quality. So if you try to include as many cases in a relatively unspecific search um, at the beginning, um, and then you have predefined inclusion and exclusion criteria that you then very rigorously apply to these data, even though we all feel the pain when another hundred cases go or another thousand cases go. Um, but I think that's important to predefine these um, this criteria so that you have less bias when selecting the cases your, yourself. And I think, you know, in some uh, diseases, maybe, maybe not necessarily in this one, although it could have applied, you might also have to have two people to go through the, um, through the database and make a decision whether this case fulfills or doesn't fulfill the criteria. I'm particularly thinking about things like pancreatitis where uh, there is no gold standard diagnosis. So you have to go with um, sort of the clinical feeling sometimes. Um, so I think I think it's really important to do it in a in a very defined way. Yeah, these are terrific suggestions. Uh, I would uh, love uh, everyone doing a retrospective study, uh, considering these uh, um, your consideration, uh, having a, a double extraction. It's uh, what we aim for right now, and uh, um, 
that these are very, very good points uh, um, is going to help uh, reproducibility of research definitely in the future. Um, but uh, getting back to your actual, uh, you know, study, until the publication of the study, most of the existing literature were basically single case reports and maybe some small case series. Uh, what further research needs to be undertaken in this field at this point? Yeah, I do think what I mentioned before, um, a prospective study, even though it might be um, relatively painful to do and it might take a relatively long time in comparison, is probably what needs to be done. Or at least um, if, for example, one or a handful of centers could agree on a sort of predefined way of working up these cases, um, if they do occur, to just say, we will try to always do these and these and these tests, and we will always try to treat like this and this first, and if it doesn't work by time X, then we're going to make a decision based on these and these criteria. Um, I think that could um, already streamline these cases that even though you're still making only clinical decisions and um, so you're not doing any sort of experimental you know data studies you're not doing something that you wouldn't otherwise do that could still streamline these cases to the point that those could be um, you know very useful to be written up and looked at even if it's then in a retrospective matter again if, if, if that makes sense and um, because I think that is the biggest sort of um, power or advantage that we have by seeing um, these rare cases in our referral hospital that um, we we can actually streamline this and actually we we here we've done this for um, quite a number of um, cases and um, I obviously deal with gastroenterology cases mostly but we have um, a flow chart that we say that this is the things that we always do when a case uh, comes that we suspect has chronic enteropathy um, and you know as I said it's not not that we would do something that cannot be clinically justified um, but that means that we can in retrospect you know look at these data again and say oh we have now a more complete um, data set to to analyze I think also, yeah. sorry, but one thing that I wanted to say, what would be really, really interesting is, um, for example, to uh, look at those biopsies again. So that could be another angle to come at uh, this particular disease to see if there are, you know, still repositories in pathology um, departments of different uh, universities or laboratories um, that might have still some of those blocks and then potentially for example uh, use some more modern methods to look for bacteria like for example fluorescent in situ hybridization or you know maybe even molecular methods um, to, to see if we can detect better if um, any sort of pathogens are involved in this and, and what they are because a lot of the ones that were culture actually mostly anaerobes or facultative anaerobes so you would think that we probably you know we can't exclude that we're missing um, some bugs that we weren't able to to culture um, and also since I've wrote this I'm obviously now uh, working in, in, in a country where uh, mycobacterial disease is much more prevalent than it um, is in Germany or is it? And maybe we haven't actually been looking for mycobacterial disease. So one of the things that I would include in a uh, in a new study, if you like, would be to test all of those samples, for example, by zeal nails and staining, and if possible, culture, um, and maybe even with PCR for uh, mycobacteria to see if they play a role, because they're obviously notoriously hard to, to detect. That's, these are yeah, uh, all uh, good, uh, um, you know, a starting point for um, the further research, definitely. Um, well, I give the word to uh, Luisa because um, uh, I think uh, I, I had all my questions answered. Thank you very much. Well, great. Thank you both very much uh, for giving up your time to talk to us today. And thank you for listening. The full version of this paper can be found in the December 2016 issue of the Journal of Small Animal Practice and a link can be found in the comments below the recording. Join us next time when we will be discussing another paper featured in the Journal of Small Animal Practice.